afternoon, everyone. Welcome to our Juneteenth celebration. I hope everybody had a really good time out on the quad with the barbecue. Yes? <laughs> Did everybody have fun? Okay, great. Awesome. We had an awesome DJ. We had some food. So thank you so much for coming out and supporting. It's been a lot of fun for me, I know, organizing. Um, and I have the distinct honor and pleasure of introducing a couple of individuals who are just phenomenal scholars, researchers, um, and I have the honor of introducing one of our very own who will then introduce our keynote. So Dr. Anthony, who goes by Tony Dunbar. Um, so I'm gonna introduce him to you all. So Tony, is it okay if I refer to you as Tony? <laughs> okay, great. So um, Tony uh, is an assistant professor here at Dominican University. He's in the School of Information Studies. He is also an equity, justice, and inclusion thought leader. His research builds on the racial and social justice frameworks of critical race theory, otherwise known as CRT. We've seen those signs everywhere. His current efforts focus on developing curriculum, scholarship, and activism to expand the CRT framework into a platform specific for information studies, critical race information theory, otherwise known as CRIT. Tony received his PhD in information studies in, and MLIS from UCLA's iSchool, along with master's degrees in education, with an emphasis in teaching and learning from the University of Utah, and in communication and training from Governor State University. He is currently a member of the American Library Association's Diversity Research Grant Committee, a 2022 co-convener for the Association of Library and Information Studies Educators Innovative Pedagogy Special Interest Group, that's a mouthful, and is the DU member board representative for the Black Metropolis Research Consortium. Tony is also the first scholar to publish a CRT article in a peer-reviewed information studies journal. Let's give it up for Tony. I almost didn't recognize that guy when she was talking. I'm like, man, I'd like to meet him but at some point. Uh, as uh, Amy has mentioned, I'm new faculty here. I'm not out the box, brand new car, new car smell new. I, but I am new, so back to, I know what Caritas Veritas is, right? Yeah, 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 I've been to the mound. So I'm, I'm still new, but again, the new car odor is, 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 is dwindling down. Um, Sometimes when you get an opportunity to connect with somebody, you see something on the universe, um, and you're optimistic that the universe is going to send you something back just based on your request. I hope so, some of you live inside of those moments of optimism. And um, so it so happens uh, mid March, Amy said, uh, if you have any ideas about a Juneteenth speaker, uh, let me know. And so I had some thoughts, and I asked a couple of people. And then I went to a, a talk for this particular book, which I'll mention by Dr. Hunt. And um, we just got to talking and, with, and within, I don't know, eight minutes, I, I said, let me, <laughs> let me mention your name inside of the dynamics of what we're doing here, here at Possible Juneteenth Speaker. Um, so let me actually get to, now that I've teased that out and uh, you can kind of see the path where, where we went, Dr. Irving Hunt is from the University of Illinois at Champaign. He got his, again, five-star cuisine. This is a Morehouse man. Call for a sec, you know, make sure your mom knows her mother, getting her money for it, right? He also got his, uh, his master's degree at uh, UC Berkeley. So he also so he went across country. Then he came back and got his PhD at Columbia. Then he got tired of traveling and went down a little bit and went over to New Jersey a little postdoc action, if, I, if I've got it right. But those of you who have gone through that, that path, you know the energy it takes to go across country and pursue your academia. So not only did he do the work, he did the, the behind the scenes work of actually pursuing, pursuing what he wanted to do. Um, as an assistant professor, he has a dual appointment in English and African American studies. He talks about a range of things and what I've met, met him he combined his digital, his humanities work with his African-American studies work in this book that came out. And this is literally like a hot off the press day signed by him the day it got released. And I heard him speak a copy of the book. Um, 
Dream in the Present. And his talk that day blew my mind. Um, not only just then following up reading the book as far as how they handle history, as far as how he handled time and history and context. Uh, today, he's going to bring a uniquely carved out conversation for us around Juneteenth. And then him and I will spend a little time together as far as following up on his talk, other books he has planned, his process as far as addressing both getting the historical context as well as getting like the social and cultural relevance of history. So I will introduce to some and present to others, Dr. Erwin Hunt. Okay, I think I, I might just stand. It might be easier for me. Um, thanks everybody for coming out. This is going to be a talk about the history of Juneteenth, uh, the truth behind the myths. Um, Okay, so today we celebrate Juneteenth, a day that represents a series of days when the country took steps toward protecting the freedom of Blacks, which is really the freedom of all. Blacks have celebrated these particular days under different names, depending on where they were in the country. It was often called Emancipation Day. For some, that fell on January 1st when the Emancipation Proclamation was ratified in 1863. For others, like for Blacks in Illinois, Emancipation Day was on September 22nd, when the proclamation was issued in its preliminary form in Washington, D.C. in 1862. Here, Blacks didn't wait for it to be ratified. They were ready from day one. And still others celebrated December 6, 1865, when the 13th Amendment was passed. June 19th was the day Union troops entered Texas in 1865 and enforced the freedom of 250,000 Blacks, two and a half years after it should have already gone into effect. A black, by, a black man by the name of Isaac Martin remembered that day. He said, I remember the Yankees of that day they, that came to read the proclamation. They was going around in a big blue uniform and a big long sword hanging at their side. I want to start sometime after these initial years. I want to start at the time of Juneteenth, that Juneteenth had already entered American cultural memory. I'm interested not just in the event of emancipation, but in the history of how we've celebrated it through the generations. I'd like us to imagine that the year is 1900 here in River Forest, Illinois. If it were 1.30 in the afternoon on June 19th, we'd most likely be gathered outside. It was 75 degrees then with a soft breeze. There would be a keynote address at this time, but it would most likely be given under a pavilion open as a tent. You can see that at the bottom of this picture. This is a picture of the celebrations that occurred in South Carolina in 1877. And the drawings are laid out in the order of events. First, there was the assembly of the parade on the top, then people running to watch it right below. Then the watching of the most important part, then they came to watch who, um, you can see this woman here. She was the goddess of liberty, and oftentimes these parades would feature what they were called the Lady Liberty or the Goddess of Liberty. And around her were representatives of the 13 Union states. And finally, the parade would end on an open green for the delivery of the keynote. In almost every celebration on record, there was a keynote a moment to remember times of slavery and times since. As we see here from a flyer for a celebration in Austin, Texas, this is another 
this is in uh, Virginia. Um, this is in Richmond, Virginia. This was the parade in, in uh, 1900 in Richmond, Virginia. This was post parade in Austin, Texas in 1900. And this was a flyer that I want to talk about for a second. Um, announcing Emancipation Day. Um, and the keynote might include a description. So this, this was a flyer to discuss or to feature, to, to um, advertise this speech. And you can't really see it in this, but in that paragraph, the description of what was talked about included the disadvantages under which the Negro was turned loose at the close of the war, end quote. It also included a comparison of the evils of slavery to the present. As the title of the flyer in the title indicates, it always included a reading of what was known as the Freedom Paper or the sometimes simply the Emancipation Proclamation, which we'll get to in a second. I wanna delve deeper, however, into what was so joyous about this day, the food, and particularly a certain drink, red soda water. We'd be sipping a glass of this bubbly goodness made from strawberry syrup with hints of vanilla. It was central to, it was essential to Juneteenth celebration in all its forms as fireworks are to the 4th of July. Historian Elizabeth Turner reports that some around 1900 claimed that they lived from one year to the next just waiting to drink red soda water. Food, food writer Nicole Taylor mined the history of this drink and mused as if her ancestors were speaking through her that a few sips and you can feel the spirit of a distant friend. Bright lipstick stains on another glass remind you of hers. Red soda water was liquid homecoming. It imparted the feeling of belonging and longing, belonging to the people you love most and longing for the people you've lost. So it seems appropriate to me that this is what we'd be drinking, feeling it sweat down the tips of our fingers while we jostled the ice. While listening, to some, while listening to someone talk about our belonging in this country and our longing for a better one. I can imagine too that we'd be smelling the nutmeg. This is another picture from 1900 um, uh, of a Juneteenth celebration. I can imagine too that we'd be smelling the nutmeg from the dry rub on the barbecued pork sifting through the crowd. We'd be thinking about that pork we were, th we were thinking about how that pork had been roasting since yesterday. Many blacks looking back have said there is no current equivalent to the all night roasted meat from Juneteenth. And that wasn't all. Dragging beneath our nose would also be the honey smell of spare ribs, the pepper of fried chicken, collard greens, turnip greens, mustard greens, the cloves and the black eyed peas, the cinnamon and the pastries, the yeast and the bread a kingdom of food that pretty soon is going to make the picnic tables groan. All these are pictures of a celebration of Juneteenth in Austin in 1900 at Eastwoods Park. You can see the delight. Anyway, I say pretty soon we still have, because we still have to get to the main event of the keynote. The reading of the Freedom Paper, which some blacks refer to simply as the proclamation. On June 19th, the proclamation in reference was a document, really a small paragraph of 194 words issued by General Gordon Granger, commander of Union troops in Texas. He was sent to Galveston a splinter of an island off the southeast side of Texas to inform the people that all slaves are free. This is the paragraph that was printed in the Galveston Daily News in 19, in, on June 19th. I'll read it. 
The people are informed that in accordance with the proclamation from the executive of the United States, all slaves are free. This involves an absolute equality of personal rights and rights of property between former masters and slaves. And the connection here to for existing between them becomes that between employer and hired labor. The freedmen are advised to remain quietly at their present homes and work for wages. They are informed that they will not be allowed to collect military posts, to collect at military posts, and that they will not be supported in idleness either here or elsewhere. This was Granger's general order number three. I'm not sure how much of it was recited at black celebrations. I am sure that black newspapers tended to reprint only the first half of the paragraph, the affirming part. I'm also sure that that's the part that still today tends to be recited in historical reenactments, not the admonishment that blacks better not be found idle. The first half sounds pretty great. It sounds like a rupture, like a real event, the swift declarative movement from slavery to wage work, from propertylessness to having a right to property, and from absolute abjection to, quote, absolute equality. You can see why this makes great oratory. It's the stuff state representatives build patriotic speeches on. It gives citizens uncomplicated reasons to affirm their pride in this country. Yet it's the second half, less ripe for the picking, that concerns me most. Granger reiterated this part in two subsequent orders that late, later that June and in July. So I'll say it again. The freedmen are advised to remain quietly at their present homes and work for wages. They are informed that they will not be allowed to collect at military posts and that they will not be supported in idleness either there or elsewhere. Let's take it one phrase at a time. They are advised to remain quietly at their present homes. They are advised to remain, and they are advised to remain quiet. Don't leave your former master, the state, the country. Don't deprive the state of its labor force. Remain complacent without complaint. They are advised to consider their plantations their present homes. Furthermore, unlike Lincoln's proclamation, which advised enslaved blacks to join Union troops, in fact, that was the point, that was part of the point of the proclamation to begin with, to bolster Union troops. Granger's proclamation not only advised against it, but warned that they would not be able to collect wages for whatever service they offered. The real zinger, however, is the last sentence. They will not be supported in idleness, either there or elsewhere. There meant in the military, a real smack in the face for the Civil War service, for their Civil War service, a suggestion that they were idle rather than vital to the war. Elsewhere meant their homes. Okay, so what we have, put simply, is a broad admonition. An admonition against any celebration of the announced freedom and an admonition against expecting this freedom to be real freedom. No, I would not want to recite this part of the story. If I were trying to uphold this order as the day freedom came, I'd want to bury it. In preparing this talk today, I have been astonished by how many myths surround Granger and this order. And I've been thinking about what the purpose of these myths are. What's their aim? What are they trying to cover up? What are they trying to convey? What don't they want us to see? The biggest myth is that Granger delivered this order as a speech in a beautiful place by the name of Ashton Villa. Here's a picture of that place from around 1866 or 1867. We don't even need this picture of the villa to see its beauty and dignity and pride. The name alone captures it, Ashton Villa. The legend goes that he proclaimed the slaves free by reading what is now known as the Juneteenth Order from the second story balcony. But there is no evidence that, that the general ever took it upon himself to speak all or part of it, let alone from the villa. Instead, he issued it the order in writing, not over a balustrade overlooking palm trees, but from a much more ordinary, much less memorable place in Galveston, Texas. His headquarters, 
which went by a much less illustrious name, the Osterman Building. This was located in an area of Galveston known as the Wall Street of the South. It held insurance companies, liquor and cigar dealers, printing presses, banks, saloons, and other markers of money. So it was still swank as things went. With its Victorian curving windows, it's the, um, it's the building on the left side, on our left, closest to us with its Victorian curving, curving windows, but it was nowhere near as swank as Ashton Villa, the very symbol of opulence. Furthermore, Granger didn't even write the order himself. It was an order given to, given to him by his boss, Union General Philip Sheridan, and Granger then passed it along to his assistant, his staff officer, who recomposed it as an order beneath which Granger signed his name. As to its distribution, it was his staff officer who dispersed it through newspapers, telegraphs, and handbills. This, of course, is not the stuff of great stories. Transforming an underling Union general into a great white savior, another Lincoln, this is much more in keeping with the American history as school boards and textbooks like it told. And it's not just textbooks that tell history through this lens. The only biography to date of Gordon Granger is titled General Gordon Granger, the savior of Chickamauga and the man behind Juneteenth. And believe it or not, that was published in 2013. Going back to, going back to the buildings, my question then is why Ashton Villa and not the Osterman? Though to be clear, I would absolutely take the upgrade in all of its dimensions if it were offered to me. And I get that things get exaggerated as they become the stuff of legend. That's just the nature of good stories. But is that all there is to it? Why I found myself wondering were these details, the general, his commitment to the cause, and the site of his supposed proclamation, the details that took and have taken center stage. Why were these details, why were these the details that grew larger than life? And I found myself reflecting that the story we're given works very hard to prop up the power of the state. Perhaps that's not so surprising. Part of the story of Juneteenth is that the state's this is that the state reached its limits. That the state's reach was limited. It wasn't enough for Lincoln to proclaim slaves free once. The force of that proclamation took time to take hold and emancipation spread unevenly across the states and territories. I don't just mean that the proclamation exempted certain states and counties from emancipating their slaves. I was shocked when in grad school I found out that it only applied to the 11 rebelling states. What I mean is that the enforcement of emancipation was delayed. And that fact that its enforcement was not immediate, that it took two orders, or as the legend would have it, two verbal proclamations might make the state look, well, weak. Relocating to a site that was a little more dignified, a little, a little more distinguished, a little more fitting of a state feeling insecure in its power makes sense from the state's point of view. Architecture can be powerful. Ashton Villa projects more power. So in turning to the actual history rather than the legend, I want to emphasize the vulnerability of state power. I think this is important because revealing these limits, these vulnerabilities, reveals the power of the common people, a power I'm not sure we've ever lost but I am sure about the vested interest in covering it up. There are better and more interesting stories we could tell about Juneteenth. The people who did exert power for the good of freedom are the people we most often forget, the black soldiers who enforced Granger's order and the Emancipation Proclamation. If we want a story of heroism, I'm not sure we do, but if we do, here's where we should look. The myth is that it was 1,800 white troops under Granger's command that made good on Lincoln's word. But the truth is that blacks composed the majority of those troops in Texas. Does the name Buffalo Soldiers ring a bell? These black troops 
are the folks that the moniker refers to. The other truth is that many enslaved people feared the white soldiers among the cavalry. These white men were reported by blacks to have looted stables for horses and houses for food. Andrew Goodman recalled in 1930 that we were scareder of them than we were of the devil. And many like Goodman who were being interviewed in the 1930s through the Federal Writers Project said these whites came and quote, took whatever they wanted. What about the Buffalo soldiers? Where are they in our story? But here, I'll caution us to remember the disadvantages of the hero's narrative. We know that when we exalt heroes, they tend to be men, and we know that they are always singular, lone stars, to steal a phrase from Texas. We know that this aloneness robs the people of their power, which is where all the power resides. We know that, fr we know that from Ella Baker, from Fannie Lou Hamer, from Elisa Garza, and so many other black female leaders. So it's not really that we need to remind ourselves who's left out of the hero's journey. Rather, we need to think about why, despite knowing that, it still remains so attractive, so satisfying. I don't think we'll get very far in scolding ourselves to want something else, to find satisfaction elsewhere. I think one of the opportunities of Juneteenth is to experience how much more of this same satisfaction can be gleaned from the record we have. What's satisfying about the hero's journey is the salvation, the mountaintop to which it ascends. But what if salvation was ongoing? Something more like a river on the ground level than, on, than an ice cap at some incredible height? What if we desire, what if what we desire in the myths we tell is what we have already, but in greater proportion and with greater and with a greater level of self-empowerment than we tend to imagine. I was listening to the Juneteenth conversation at the National Museum of African American History yesterday, and one thing Amani Perry said was that Juneteenth commemorates the last people to hear that they were free. Professor Perry's point was not that this is true, but that at bottom, this is how most people think of the day. The conversation went on to mention, in passing, the Emancipation slow piecemeal rollout. As I myself mentioned, the Emancipation Proclamation applied only to the quote, designated states in rebellion, the 11 Confederate states, people in border non-rebelling states like Kentucky and Delaware had to wait until the 13th Amendment was ratified in December of 1865. Even after all the years, even after all the years Blacks had to wait for the 13th Amendment, however, Blacks in Indian Territory, as it was called, had to wait an additional year for treaties to be signed. It is tragic that there has been no final day to slavery. It is tragic that there's really no day on the calendar that we can say freedom began. It is tragic, but it is also fruitful. It forces us to think of freedom as an ongoingness, something more like a river than an ice cap. It forces us to see it as an opportunity to be continually civically engaged and to think of that process as a continual self-transformation, not a transformation with a finish line and a point in the sky. So to go back to Amani Perry's point that we remember Juneteenth as the day the last of us got the news we were free, it would be unreasonable to think that this was true even if the proclamation had been enforced everywhere else. We long, Blacks long had that news in Texas. In fact, that news had been spread around Texas fast as flames. Over 100 Texas newspapers mentioned the proclamation between 1862 and 1864. It was, quote, to what one historian says, it was, quote, common knowledge. It makes more sense to think of Juneteenth as the day the celebration of that knowledge was for a moment protected. When I think of Juneteenth and my own version of red soda water, for me as a half Jamaican, that water was sorrow. I think of all the versions of this day that testify not to when blacks realized they were free, but when whites decided to help protect that realization. To quote historian Jelani Cobb, who wrote about Juneteenth in the New Yorker two years ago, 
Emancipation is a marker of progress for white Americans, not black ones. I want to spend the rest of my time talking about what that emancipation meant for blacks in 1865. The message of my talk thus far has been that there's always been a freedom that blacks have enjoyed, imagined, and protected themselves. If we return again to Granger's admonishment, the part that said, you will not be supported in idleness anywhere, at any time, even in your own homes. If we return to that, we can see some indication of what freedom for blacks might have been because it was the only freedom that made sense. The freedom to be unproductive for capitalism. The freedom to rest, to care for oneself, to care for each other as oneself. This was the freedom to hold each other as we did when we sipped our red drink, that cool cup of loving, that cup of touching the people we love. Ultimately, what I am talking about is a collective rest, a rest so profound that state officials felt it was disruptive. What I'm talking about then is the freedom to rest and the freedom to disrupt. The freedom of disruption may not only be, may not actually be separable from the freedom to rest. The reason I am stressing this freedom is that so many of the conversations around Juneteenth end with the question, how do we pair this celebration with anti-Black violence? How do we pair it with Tulsa, with Minneapolis, and Buffalo? What do we make of the fact that every resurgence of Juneteenth since its first celebration in 1866 has occurred in response to a resurgence of racial violence? Juneteenth celebration re celebrations receded in the 1970s and 80s, then kicked back up again after Rodney King and the LA riots. This wouldn't be a national holiday today without the murder of George Floyd and the movement for Black lives. The question of how we pair these things makes sense. My worry is that by raising this question as if these moments are paradoxical, as if they don't make sense together, presumes that the freedom we celebrate is the freedom to advance the story of American progress. Accumulation, the freedom to consume, to make money, or as Granger stated, to sell one's work with, quote, absolute equality to everyone else. The freedom to live the good life. The freedom we celebrate may in fact be to disrupt it, the good life. Or as Fannie Lou Hamer said in 1967, when she badly needed rest, what I really feel is necessary is that black people in this country will have to upset this apple cart. The answer usually given to how we pair moments of black celebration with moments of horror is that we are taking one step forward only to take two steps back. But that answer presumes we are all trying to step in the same direction when maybe all along we've been trying to find different ones. I'd like to end by looking at firsthand accounts that suggest different directions. In the spirit of Juneteenth as a day of remembrance, I'm going to read some of the testimonies Blacks gave about how they received the news in Texas that emancipation had, a right, had arrived with bright swords at its side. I meant to also show you some slides that I forgot uh, about. This is. Um, from a, a celebration in Virginia. I love this celebration because the leisure, it's so adamantly leisure and no one is trying to get up. Um, and I think to me that that is the kind of state of joy that speaks, that resonates most profoundly to me about Juneteenth. Um, this is a, it reminded me of this, this um, painting by Kerry James Marshall called Past Times. And I think that that um, name is, you know, is perfect for, for this talk. He, he, he um, finishes in 1997. And you can see that it's a similar kind of leisure he's trying to capture here. So this is Elsie Reese. Um, she was 90 years old. You can barely see her face on this, but 
She was 90 years old, and this is the photograph that was captured when she gave this testimony. She says, I was born in Grimes County 90 years ago. That a long time, child. A heap of change since then. We couldn't see them airplanes flying in the air and hear folks sing and talk a thousand miles away. When I was young, the farthest you could hear anybody was about a quarter of a mile. And then they had to holler like a stuck hog. Then surrender comes and Master jo Jim read the long paper. He say, I explain to you, it the order of the government that make it against the law to keep you slaves. You should see them colored folks. They just plumb shock. Their faces long as they arms and so pestered they don't know what to say or do. Massa never say another word and walks away. The colored folks say, where are we going to live? What are we going to do? They frets all night. We'll come back to the rest of it. I begin with Reese, his testimony, because it's not the nominal story of loud jubilee. I begin here to show that simultaneous to that jubilation was a query, what did freedom mean? They fretted all night. Part of the freedom Miss Reese exercised was to question the meaning of freedom and to sustain that question all night. She goes on to say, next morning, Master say, what you ones gonna do? Uncle John say, when do we have to go? Then Massa laughs hardy and say, you can stay, you can stay on for wages or work on halves. Well, sir, they're, bound to, they're a bunch of happy colored folks after they learned that they could stay and work. And my folks stays nearly two years after emancipation. Then all of us moves to Navasota and hires us out as cooks. I cooked till I 18 and then I married John Love. He a carpenter and right off builds a house on the land he buy from Dr. Terrell, his old master. Here's another testimony by a man named William Matthews. He was 89 and he also remembered his, the precarity um, and when, when he met the news of the proclamation and um, when he heard the proclamation read and um, he compared it to taking an old horse and turning it loose. But I like how he begins with his life as a child because somehow I get the sense of him that I wouldn't without that. Me and Bill Adams raised together. When he shot a deer, I run home like a greased, like greased lightning and get the horse. Sometimes he'd shoot a big hog and I'd skin him. Later he says, all the talk about freedom was so bad on the plantation, the master make me up the men in a big wagon and drive them to Winfield. He say in Texas, there never gonna be no freedom. I drive them fast till night and it take about two days, but they come back home. But master say, if he catch any of them, he gonna shoot them. They hang around the woods and dodge round and round till the freedom man come by. We went right on working after freedom. Old Buck Adams wouldn't let us go. It was way after freedom. The freedom man come and read the paper and tell us not to work no more. Let us get paid for it when he gone. But Mary Adams, she come out. I recollect what she say as if I just hear her say it. She say 10 years from today, I'll have you all back again. That 10 years been over a mighty long time and she ain't got us back yet and she dead and gone. They make us get right off the place, just like you take an old horse and turn it loose. That's how it was. No money, no nothing. I get a job working for a white man on the farm, but he couldn't pay much. He didn't have nothing. He gave me just enough to get a pack or two of meal and a little syrup. William and Reese remember quieter, more pensive responses to the news of freedom. Reese says a bunch of folks were happy after they learned that they could stay and work, but it is not clear what they were happy about, the freedom to stay, to be paid, some combination of both. 
or another freedom altogether. I think there is power in sitting with the mystery of it, that in and that in of itself is disruptive and restive in its refusal of closure. One of the most popular stories of how the news was greeted came from Felix Haywood. Here he is in this picture. He's 92 here. And you can see in just his disposition how wily of a tale he sowed. I mean, look at him. Hip akimbo, his hand on his cane, like he's using it more for gesticulation than support. The upturned wrinkles on his forehead as if he's asking, are you sitting down? Also, he's supposed to be blind, yet he's staring directly at the center of the camera with eyes bright as moons. He must have been staring. He must have been standing um, because his interviewer, Fred Dibble, in his report said he was scribbling down the story which included the kind of reaction to emancipation that has become fabled. How did you know the end of the war had come? Asked Dibble. How did we know it? Hallelujah broke out. Abe Lincoln freed the N-word with the gun and the trigger. And I ain't going to get whipped anymore. I got my ticket leaving the thicket and I'm headed for the golden shore. Soldiers, all of a sudden, was everywhere, coming in crunched bunches, crossing and walking and riding. Everyone was a singing. We was all walking on golden clouds. Hallelujah. Union forever. Hooray, boys. Hooray. Although I may be poor, I'll never be a slave, shout in the battle cry of freedom. What's the time scale, the time frame of something that breaks out? Usually short. Sorry, I'm now editorializing. Um, that meant to be in my margins. Anyway, we all felt like heroes and nobody made us what, nobody made us that way but ourselves. We was free. Everybody went wild. We all felt like heroes and nobody made us that way but ourselves. Just like that, we were free. It didn't seem to make the whites mad either. They went on giving us food just the same. Nobody took our homes away. But right off, colored folks started on the move. They seemed to want to get closer to freedom. To, so they know what it was, what it, so they know what it was, like it was a place or a city. Me and my father stuck, stuck close as a lean tick to a stick kitten. <laughs> the Gudlows started us out on a ranch. My father, he'd run up cattle, unbranded cattle for the whites. They was cattle that they belonged to. They was cattle that they belonged to, all right. They had gone to find water along the San Antonio River and the Guadalupe. Then the whites gave me and my father some cattle for our own. My father had his brand, and we had a herd to start out with of 70. We soon found out that freedom can make folks proud, but it didn't make them rich. We knowed freedom was on us, but we didn't know what was to come with it. We thought we was going to get rich like the white folk because we was stronger and knowed how to work and the whites didn't and they didn't have us to work for them anymore. But it didn't turn out that way. We soon found out that freedom could make folks proud, but it didn't make them rich. Did you ever stop to think that, um, uh, this is the interviewer, did you ever stop to think that the thinking don't do any good, oh sorry, no, it's not the interviewer. Did you ever stop to think that the thinking don't do any good when you do it too late? Well, that's how it was with us. If every mother's son of a black had thrown away his hoe and took up a gun to fight for his own freedom along with the Yankees, the war would be over before it began. So that's Felix Haywood. And I, I'm going to end there, but I want to end by saying that I think what these stories and these testimonies help us do and what so many different kinds of Juneteenths following different days under different names encourage us to do is to take this day as an opportunity to say something more than a single story, um, to fashion different stories and to be open to their refashioning as we go along. So thank you for this opportunity to tell a Juneteenth story. Yeah.
And I was curious to ask a question when you're speaking to scholars like, uh, like being delved into making presentations and, and writing papers, uh, you grow a little bit. What was you before you got presented with this opportunity? What were your thoughts about and, and your grasping and your embracing of Juneteenth, uh, the history of it, and your own personal engagement with it? You know, um, I I I think what what shocked me most was when looking at these testimonies. I always took it as um, W. B. Du Bois described it in Black Reconstruction as a frenzy, as a as the day for blacks when they thought the apocalypse came, a kind of wildness, um, and. I grew by just thinking about first the tempered language and the tempered responses that so many of them had over and over and over again and how rare Felix Haywood's story, he's also a storyteller as you can see, um, how rare that story was. And so um, for me, I think it was, it's been a time to just kind of think what it would have been like you know, just as a kind of exercise in my imagination, what it would have been like for me to hear that news, to not have any place to go, and also the kind of dangers of celebration in public that I knew would be, you know, I would feel if I, you know, so I think it's been a, a moment that I felt, that I felt more connected to this period than I had when I think of it as a wildness, as an ecstatic celebration. Um, so you did with this what you've done with your book uh, uh, about the present as well, right? The, there's a there's this time continuum that you you bring us back and forth from. Uh, one of my favorite shows is This Is Us. They can take you through time on different levels and with different characters. So way Juneteenth uh, unfolded and then what it is as a celebration today, there, you know, it, it, it's evolving um, exponentially grew once it became a holiday, but the momentum of it has, has, has come over the years. It's come through a lot of periods, like right? Jim Crow, civil rights. What is your um, kind of thought process of what can, what, what are the hopeful possibilities of this other than a politicized moment mm. or um, one extra day to be off, yeah. you know, beyond where it's going to get appropriated mm -hmm. for African American folks who are looking around social justice. What, what are, what's the potential here? You know, I mean, I think that one of the things that came through in all the testimonies was the joy. I mean, the, there was no matter no matter how they were talking about it, there was joy, and I think that the power of joy and taking the day off, the power of rest, I think we, we underestimate how, how incredible. And the other thing too is that, you know, Toni Morrison has this beautiful phrase where she says, the function of freedom is to free someone else. And, you know, the collective nature of Juneteenth, the fact that it was. It, it didn't matter that it was different narratives, that it was a different red drink. The, the, the variation of it in and of itself is something that I think can guide us in our political practices, various different ways of protesting and, and engaging politically. I think that's, that's what, you know, Emancipation Day, Freedom Day, I think that's, I think that's what that represents. That's what it can teach us now. From my context, a lot of it is the um, the, operate, the opportunity to uh, be empowered around narrative, and then or, or generate your own narrative. Yeah. So to that, you know, spinning off of th that thought, um, you don't do this without some sort of archival background, find some context. Um, a lot of our history isn't owned by us as far as the artifacts and what have you, um, and there and for not a lot of our own narrative to get out in our own context, mm -hmm. um, but in, in your book, in your writing, in your talks, um, the historian comes out 
So the power and the places in which you get this stuff, can you speak to that? Uh, the value of and, and, and where do you go look to find the uniqueness mm -hmm. of these stories that, you know, mm -hmm. on a Tuesday afternoon, like, well, I want to know a little bit more. You know, you got to go past Wikipedia, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I'm reminded of um, Amani Perry, who said when she was talking about her incredible book, South to America, um, she, you know, a lot of that book is a narration of her own family history. And she was talking about the importance of us embracing our own personal family archives, not throwing them out, not letting them get dusty and rotten in boxes in our basement, because those are the archives that we have. Those are the stories that we have ultimately to use at these repositories. So the um, to me, I mean, I think that the, the question of the Black archive, it begins with us, begins with what archive are we building and preserving in our homes, in our families? Because it, it's also just where institutionally it has begun. And uh, inside the digital age, it's probably become a little bit easier um, to start thinking about how, you know, digital spaces is cheaper, yeah. you put a lot of things there, but that the, the education and those, the dynamics of that, I think are very important, not only on an institutional basis, but from a collective memory uh, point of view. Yeah. Um, let's talk about you a little bit. Yeah. Um, not necessarily from Illinois. So don't, why don't we start there? And then how you got to have this type of passion. Um, so, you know, it's been, uh, been a long journey, I guess, for me. I, 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 I have come to this kind of work of the interaction between art and activism, mainly because I've wanted, out of grad school, I wanted to discuss concrete things. I felt the, the, the need to um, talk about stuff, talk about ideas that were flowering from the ground up, like literally in the streets and to sort of to think about literature in a broader span than bound books and to, to think about the kind of um, documents and ephemera that are also incredibly poetic and literary. And, and that stuff really made me feel more connected to the world. And so I've followed that through, I think, you know, my, my book was a departure from my dissertation. And so I followed, I followed that kind of material history since then, just, just out, of a, out of a need to, 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 to feel more grounded, I guess you could say. I'll ask another and I'll start sharing with the audience as well. How does that show up in your classroom? So it's almost like you, the two areas of where you have your um, appointments, African-American studies and English is almost like the the happy zone between doing work that Morrison uh, and narratives Morrison lays out, and you develop your own unique style. Yeah. How did that show up in your pedagogy? How did that show up in your classroom? Mm. Um, what has been your experience or joy or challenges in? Now, because what it's great when it's coming out of you, you can put it on a little paper. But when you stand before people and present your work and mm. and, and offer it as education and enlightenment. The, the, the temperature in the room could change. Yeah, I mean, the, what I love about the classroom is that you get to do this kind of thing every week. I mean, you have the energy, uh, but you know, you get, you, get the, you get to tell the stories, you get to tell new stories. And so um, it's, it's, it's also just a, a, a testing ground for my ideas too. And um, my, my classrooms are, um, they, they delve deep into the archive generally. Um, but the, the, the notion that you get to sit with folks to think about not just a, think how the story was told, but to reconstruct it collectively together, that to me is like the essence of what makes you know, the classroom shine, those bright moments of discovery of new paths into the history and new paths into the future. Um, so, I mean, I, I, I feel like the work is, is congruent in that way. Thank you so much uh, for your talk. Yeah. Uh, I have maybe a question on one end, but 
uh, it invites an interesting uh, thing about temporality. And so mm. uh, for me, think about the admonition and about idleness. Mm. Um, and I'm thinking about uh, enslaved persons who were in this precarious state mm. where they were hired out. Mm. So like Frederick Douglass, and he's working mm. for a time and he's entering into labor contracts on his own mm -hmm. during a time when he's an enslaved person mm -hmm. and how uh, for a small number of, uh, of enslaved people, primarily in, in Southern cities, um, they were sort of experiencing a, a sort of situation where they were engaged in wage labor, mm -hmm. but they didn't fully control mm -hmm. that. Um, mm -hmm. But that was before um, the Civil War and, and before uh, mm -hmm. these dates of emancipation that you've mentioned. But your talk also uh, invited me to think about Brown versus Board of Education mm -hmm. and the phrase the Supreme Court used, deliberate speed, mm -hmm. which in mm -hmm. some ways uh, creates a, a similar type of way in which there is this sort of date of desegregation that we talk about as a country, and yet there are places um, uh, where uh, it was years later mm. where schools were desegregated. Mm. Um, and even when they were desegregated, uh, private, uh, so like white academies had been set up mm. um, so that by the time you had integrated schools in parts of the country, uh, uh, so like the wind was already a hollow one. Um, so mm. uh, I don't know if you have any reactions yeah, to this. Yeah, I do. I, 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 I do. I have, I have many reactions to that. Um, you've asked me to talk about time, which is the center of my, my temporality, which is the center of my work. But the, the, um, what, I, what I love about your question is what it asks, invites me to do, which is, is to, um, us, us to do, is to, is, to, is to question the progress narrative, not just as an uneven narrative, but as potentially an inaccurate one in its essence, and to think about different ways of shaping time other than, you know, a mountain or other than an apex, other than a rise and fall or a continuous or dialectical ascent that we can see from, you know, just the history itself and, and, and what ways that we can think about shapes of time that are more empowering and truer. Um, and I mean, the idea of what the temporality of idleness is and the temporality of rest. And, you know, I mean, I don't have an answer off the top of my head. I mean, I'm actually reading a book on, on just that very um, idea, you know, a, a time that can't be appropriated into something that we would consider productive. I think, I mean, I feel like that's the kind of invitation that this history and the unevenness helps us do rather than lament that we haven't progressed further. We can think about, wait, there's all these other ways to imagine our world other than progress. And what can that do for us spiritually and for our bodies, et cetera, you know? So um, thank you. So before we close, um, I'm a South Side Chicago guy. So my cousins always teach me like I got eight jobs. I'm always hustling. Right? I would be remiss if I didn't give you the opportunity to talk about the straight monographs. I'm going to put it in your hand um, <laughs> for a second versus me. And um, there's, there's several things in there that, uh, so I'm going to keep it to two questions. I'm going to keep it to two questions. At the very beginning, uh, you. Uh, you talk about the concept of hope, and you move it along a continuum, right, of, of not necessarily this future aspiration, but bringing it in the context of the book of hope of right now and the power of a, uh, a tangible textual hope. I'm, I'm rambling, so I'm yeah. passing it back Yeah, to you. okay. No, I mean, you're talking about this thing. Thank you. We're talking about the, this idea that um, I was reading a letter that Fannie Lou Hamer received from one of her neighbors, and that's where I begin the book. And the letter, in the letters, the, the, the neighbor was um, saying, hope me something. And, and I, I remember that phrase, and I actually don't remember any of the letter, but I remembered that particular phrase because it was a, a, a way of using the word hope in a way that felt like, you know, much more immediate, like it, the hope itself carried what you needed rather than hoping for something to come at 
the hope itself was very active and very immediate. It gave you the thing you needed right now. And so that's so I started this idea um, of now hope um, rather than a future hope with the book. But you know, the book itself, to go back to this gentleman's question, is a, a, is is really about the question of what does a movement look like when it doesn't need to hope for a better tomorrow? Or what does a movement look like without the mandate or without relying on a narrative of progress to either motivate it, to explain it? What kind of timescapes and what kind of ways can we think of being in time outside of that? Um, and the case study, you could say, is the Black Cooperative Movement, which was all about pooling your resources and, um, and sort of making that now hope real. Um, and so that, you know, in, in sum, is, is what, the, what the book discusses, the different shapes of time and, 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 and tells the, the first long story of that, of that movement of mutual aid. So I'm gonna finish up with some things that uh, bridge like the president and that book and so, something I, uh, I picked up that has stuck with me since March. Um, and that's um, terrorism on black folks. I mean, I'm just, I have no other term for it. And you talked about the Colored Farmer, uh, Farmers Alliance, a cooperative alliance, um, that the power it had at one point at its apex, it had uh, economic stability, viability, and that it disappeared rather quickly around the same concept from my from my interpretation as terrorism. Um, yeah, yeah, I mean, the Colored Farmers Alliance and Cooperative Union was the biggest organization in um, Black American history before Marcus Garvey's UNIA movement. It was the biggest organization at that point in 1886 in um, totaling almost a million members across every Southern state in the South. And it was a, as, as you can hear in the, in the name of it, it was an organization about um, collective power, cooperatives. Um, um, and it was um, um, disbanded af after this massacre in the floor of Mississippi in 1889 um, because of the amount of property that they were amassing and the, the threat to, to, to white businesses at the time. And so it didn't last long. I mean, we're talking about seven years and yet it was the, you know, the, the size of it is kind of incredible for the temporal span of it. Um, so um, the, book, the book begins there telling that story and how the cooperative movement that followed in the 20th century were a way to sort of bring that back into bloom. Folks, you can get a, not only do you have, did you get this presentation, which I think is outstanding. I think uh, the Caxton's Club has your presentation that you made about this book. This book is currently available, but um, I have a modified version of the YouTube that I use in my classes already. Oh, and, wow. so, and I've only known you for a couple of years. <laughs> You're already on the syllabus, right? So I, I, I appreciate, I appreciate that work. Um, and if you want to do a little follow-up about the book by Dr. Hunt, um, you can find him on the University of Illinois website, you know. <laughs> um, let's give him a round of applause. Thank you. Thank you again. Thank you, Dr. Hunt and Dr. Dunbar. We're so appreciative for your introduction to Dr. Hunt. Um, let's give them another round of applause. For So if you're interested in purchasing, well, first I wanna say there's copies of Dreaming the Present in our library. So there's copies in Rebecca Crown Library. So go down there, take one out. It is definitely a, a really good read. I borrowed Tony's copy this last April. Um, and you got a little bit of a taste of it in this careful, close reading of the photos. It he takes you on a really beautiful journey through time. It's just incredible. So I highly recommend it. Um, and we, and you can also purchase the book. I think it's like, just go to the website. I, maybe you can help me with this. It's unclongleafservices.org. Is that right? The publisher? Uh, UNC press. 
UNC Press. Okay, so independent press and purchase. Yes, independent. Okay. Um, again, uh, just thanks to Dr. Tony Dunbar for, for helping to bring Dr. Hunt here. I also want to make sure I shout out, there's so many people that helped make today possible the full gamut of, of festivities. Um, so Gabby Nicholas, uh, Jackie Neri Arias, and the, the staff of the Center for Cultural Liberation. Special shout out to Zuli, Olivia, Uli. Yes. And one of our very own TRHT uh, Summer Fellows, Marquise, who's here with us today. Thank you, Marquise. Um, also, Troy Tonsil and Lori Svensson, uh, sorry, Lauren Svetson for organizing the games out on the lawn this afternoon. Thank you so much for that. Our DJ Dapper, he was awesome. He's gone now, but he was so great. Um, also, to everyone whose leadership contributes to events like these, Dr. Precious Porras, our VP for DEI. Our phenomenal uh, staff in DuPac, Sam Barr, Patrick Serrano, Melanie Thompson, Leslie Rodriguez, Dr. Rachel Hart Winter from the Siena Center. Yes, so many good people. Also, Deb Cash and Dave Carlson for all of their uh, support, Samela Hargrove and her team. Um, and finally, on behalf of uh, the Office for Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion, we, we need to thank some of our campus partners whose funding um, helped to make all of the festivities possible today. So uh, they contributed funds. So Rosary College of Arts and Sciences, the School of Information Studies, Student Success and Engagement, the Department of Sociology and Criminology, University Ministry, the College of Applied Social Sciences, Staff Council, the Performing Arts Center, uh, scheduling and event services and dining services. So just a big round of applause. Thank you again all for, for coming, for being present. And I hope that this weekend uh, you are filled with the joy, the spirit of the celebration, some leisure, some time to like unplug from the capitalist society that's got us like driving ourselves like mad. So Let's take a note from Dr. Hunt and, and really do that. So thank you again. Peace all.